Yeah. Jesus sent you in. We're still trying to get some uh, help. Good morning. It's so good to see you on this beautiful Sunday. Oh man, it actually is starting to feel like summer out there. Um, man, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Conan. I'm the Creative Arts and Student Ministry Director here at Victory Lutheran Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Would you stand with us as we read our call to worship, which comes from John 4, verses 23 and 24, and then also 2 Corinthians verses, or chapter 3, verse 17. Which reads, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Let us worship the Lord this morning, church. I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts and minds, healing brokenness. I feel a generation breaking through despair. I hear a generation. Full of faith declare in the song it will be out of the darkness 
we will rise and sing. Oh, He is faithful, He is glorious, and He is Jesus, and all my hope is in Him. He is freedom he is healing right now he is the hope and joy love and peace in life hey I... oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. I have seen the light Like the break of dawn Giving blindness sight Letting name and walk I see a generation With resurrection life We are a generation Filled with the battle of Christ And our song, it will be Out of the darkness, we will rise and see Oh, He is faithful, He is glorious in He is Jesus and all my hope is in Him. He is freedom. He is healing right now. He is the hope and joy and love and peace in life. Yeah. Oh. Sing me his pain. And he has paid the highest price. And he has proven his great love for us. And we will praise him with our life. Yeah, proclaim my love for him. He's paid, yeah. Cause he has paid the highest price. And he has proven his great love for us. And we will praise him with our life. And proclaim my love for Him. Yeah. And proclaim my love for Him. For Him. And proclaim my love for Him. Can we give God some praise this morning, church? Hallelujah. Yeah, oh, I'm live. Good morning. Good morning. If you have a Bible, you opened up to uh, the book of Acts. Book of Acts, uh, chapter 2. Uh, Dwight Schmidt called me and asked me to take this Sunday. And I was so excited to be in front of my home congregation. And then I looked for what the scripture was for today. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's Pentecost Sunday. Yeah. I don't get to talk about going fishing. I don't get to talk about wee little men up in a tree. I get to talk about the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of the Pentecost arrived, 
Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in their, our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. Father, we ask that you would bless this time together. Thank you for your gathering of your loved ones. Thank you that you your Holy Spirit has drawn us together. Lord Jesus, hear our praise, our worship to you now as the team leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What I could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Oh, how
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Let's do that again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Oh, Jesus, yours is the victory. Oh, yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Has lost its grip for me. You have broken every chain. nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare your living hope your presence Lord and I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone oh yes in your presence Lord we'll sing it Holy Spirit you are Come find this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Yes, your presence, Lord. I taste. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves 
Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Yes, in your presence, Lord Singing Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, you are welcome Comfort this place and fill the Father God, we long for your presence here today. Holy Spirit, just fill this place today. Fill our hearts today, God. Soften our hearts today. Open our eyes, open our ears, God, so we can see and hear your goodness today and the words that you have for us today. We love you in Jesus' mighty, powerful name. Amen. Can we give God some more praise today? Come on. Man. Hey, I'm looking around this room, and I'm seeing uh, some new faces here. And if you didn't come here with somebody today, I just encourage you, turn around, greet the person next to you, say welcome to home. Welcome home to victory. Welcome to victory. All right. 
I love seeing the fellowship. I love seeing that. That's awesome. If I didn't get a chance to say good morning to you personally this morning, I'll catch you before you leave today, I promise. Uh, so good that you're here with us today. We have a few announcements, though, and I believe the first one we have a video for, if I'm not mistaken. Do we got the video? Uh, where's Doug? Which one, Doug? <laughs> Long one. <laughs> All right, let's get some volume. I think Christian education is just such a vital part of who we become as a human being. When we have Jesus, he came to earth to teach us how to act and how to talk to people and how to be love and light to people. When we have that, it changes how we approach education. When we have struggles, we pray for each other. We can, just this week, we stood in a circle and held hands and prayed for a friend who was struggling. And we feel that love it's just this constant show of grace and of love and surrendering our hearts to each other and especially to God. And when we can do that as a classroom, it changes the atmosphere. The kids, all the kids here, they love being here and they love learning about Jesus and they love how positive all the teachers are and how Learning about God is just a very important part. Like, I feel like we try and draw that back into everything. Every child would feel very, very welcome here at Victory. Um, the children, when somebody new comes to our school, they are openly welcomed with arms of love and excitement from the kids. And um, I think you would find at Victory that um, the education is actually very, very good. A lot of people don't know that um, private education is not standing in a circle and singing kumbaya all day. Sometimes it, people think that. And we educate not you know, at a low level, but we hold very high standards for our kids. So I think you would really be pleased if your child came to Victor Christian. Go ahead. Do you like all your friends? His friends? Big friendly school with friends? Or... Math. You like math? Math. Oh, okay. Do you like your teachers? Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. Go ahead, Faith. Um, what I like about being at Victory Christian School is I always know I'm welcome and I always know I'm comfortable about being around my friends. Thank you for sending me to Victory. Thank you for sending me to Victory. Thank you! Man, yeah, pretty cute. I still can't get over that she really likes math. I was like, I, when I was her age, I hated math, but to each their own. But as you can see, we, I don't know if you guys knew about this, but we have probably one of the best kept secrets here at Victory Lutheran Church with our own Christian school that's like literally in our basement. Um, and this isn't just like a, it's not just like the Victory Lutheran Christian School. It's Victory Christian School, meaning it's a non-denominational school, meaning we have kids from like all over town, different denominations coming to this church, or not to this church, but to this school. And uh, you guys, it's probably, uh, I, Dwight took the words out of my mouth. I said it was one of the best, but he said it's probably, he said it is the best. And I'm inclined to agree with him. We have some of the best teachers in this town right here in our own school. And uh, it was really cool, like, this past year, just seeing how much, like, this school has blown up. It's starting, to be, it's starting to be found out that it is the best Christian school in our town. And what an opportunity for us here that have kids that attend Victory Christian or Victory Lutheran Church to attend our own school. And so 
Today, after church, we have a Victory Lutheran Church Scholarship fundraising picnic happening, and it's also going to double as our volunteer appreciation picnic as well. But we're going to be taking a free will offering um, to benefit our Victory Lutheran Church Scholarship Fund that benefits students that are going to Victory Christian School that attend here at Victory Lutheran Church. I know that's kind of a lot of words, a lot of Victory Lutheran, Victory Christian, it's, it gets mixed up, but just so you know, the funds that we raise there go to help kids that attend here on Sunday mornings to attend that church, or excuse me, to attend <laughs> that school. I'm sorry, I'm getting all twisted up in my own mind. Um, but come on out, it's going to be a lot of fun. We got a lot of hot dogs, a lot of yummy food. You guys going to have to eat extra for me because I'm not supposed to eat that stuff right now. Um, so be sure to come and eat all the hot dogs that we have because I don't want any left over. Um, so yeah, that's happening today right after this, right after the service, right at noon. So stick around. It's going to be a beautiful day and it's not like super windy yet. So we could probably play some Frisbee. Um, there's that. Also, we have on the agenda, uh, save the date for Vacation Bible School. So Vacation Bible School is going to be happening August 15th through the 18th. It's going to be a lot of fun. iPoint's coming out to do it. Uh, cost looks like it's going to be 25 bucks per student. Um, and if you want more information, you can call the church. We'd be happy to talk to you over the phone. Um, and I just found out this uh, last week, um, but online registration. So if you go to our website, you can register right online, um, right there on our website, findvictory.org. So be sure to mark your calendars for that. I'm sure spots are going to be limited, and it will probably fill up pretty fast. Um, looking ahead, um, we also settled on a date to re-shingle Nancy Dahl's roof, June 25th. Uh, looks like we're going to start about 7 a.m., and uh, we would love to get as many of you there. We had a pretty big list of people signing up to help, um, so we just wanted to make sure you guys knew. June 25th, shingling project begins at 7 a.m. You got the address there on the bottom, and if you have any other questions, you can call, uh, call the church, call Dwight Schmidt. Um, he would be more than happy to answer any questions there, but this would be an awesome opportunity to bless one of our own, and uh, what a blessing that is. So, and I will say this, many hands will make light work. So, yes. Uh, next, just another heads up, um, there's going to be no supervised nursery, but it's going to be open for you to use, so if you need to duck out, just know that there's a full, like, nursery down the hall over here. And uh, there is speakers in there, so you can still hear the sermon. But if you need to duck out, take your little one out to go nurse or whatever, um, right down that hallway, it's for you to use. And then uh, also, we just want to remind everyone, Pastor Sean is on sabbatical. And um, what that means is he's taking some time to recharge, get his batteries refreshed, uh, so he can come back here next fall and be like full tilt, ready to go in the ministry which makes me a little nervous because he's been running full tilt for so long. I almost wonder what a uh, fully rested Pastor Sean is capable of, so buckle up. I have a feeling we're all in for a surprise. Um, but we're really excited for, that he's been able to take advantage of this. Um, I don't know if any of you knew this, but his son, Luke, uh, just got married yesterday at like five. Beautiful wedding. So I know he's already like kicking off his sabbatical very strong with a nice family trip out to the East Coast. And uh, we, would just, we would just like to emphasize, if you have any needs, not to call him, but you can call the elders here. Um, their numbers are listed on the slide here. And uh, if you don't have their number, you can always call the church. We'd be more than happy to point you in the direction of one of our elders here, too. And with that being said, I'm going to pray for this morning's offering. And it is at that time in our service where we do give back to God our tithes and our offerings. And whatever the Lord is placing on your heart to give, we would just encourage you. There's a basket out there in the narthex. Before you leave today, go ahead and just drop that into our basket. Uh, the, offering, uh, the offering text for this morning comes from Hebrews 7, verses 1 and 2, reading, This Malchizedek, Malik, Malchizedek was king of Salem. And priest of God Most High, he met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Father God, we just ask that um, you would have your hand over this morning's offering. And the tithes that you receive here, God, would you put to work how you see fit, God. Blessing 
not only uh, what goes on here at um, VLC or here in Jamestown, God, but what happens worldwide through um, different missionaries that we support in places like Chad, places like Taiwan. God, we just ask that you would, you would further your kingdom with these offerings. We thank you, God, for the blessings that you've given us each and every day, God, the breath that you fill our lungs with and the roofs over our heads. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, um, I have, the, I have the, the pleasure of getting to introduce a fellow brother of the, of the pulpit, um, Lynn Hopewell, who, if uh, you were here last week and you heard my sermon, I was heavily giving him credit because uh, most of his, the sermon I gave last week was inspired by this man. So I'm really excited to invite my brother, Lynn Hopewell, to come forward to share the word today to you all. Would you guys give him a warm welcome? Thanks, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I, I'm just amazed. I'm just amazed. At that age, she likes math. And he said that at, he learned to like math. I'm six decades older than her. I still don't like math. I still don't like it. Well, I talked about being asked to, to speak this morning. And if you have your Bible, open your Bible then to the passage to Romans chapter 8. We'll be reading there. We'll be reading uh, several verses from there. Um, there's no points this morning. So when you're all said and done, you might just go home and say, that. well, that was pointless. But it's kind of, it, I, I just had to kind of go with it. I had to focus, I had to focus on it. And uh, I, just, I just told Faye, I, I just don't think I'm going to send you any points. Give them a blank sheet of paper and let them decide what they want to do with it. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go with that. Um, this, reminds me, this reminds me of a story about uh, the little boy. He was four years old. He's four years old. It's the night before his fifth birthday. And he's being tucked into bed by his mom. And his mom is trying to explain the idea of a birthday to this four-year-old. And she says, Kevin, tonight when you lay down, how old are you? And he holds up his four fingers. He's been doing this for a year, right? For an entire year. Every time somebody asks him, he proudly holds up those four fingers. And she says, that's right. And she says, when you go to sleep tonight, you're four years old. Do you know what you'll be when you wake up tomorrow? Adds the thumb, and he says, tomorrow I'll be a handful. <laughs> this is a handful. Reading in Jesus' name, beginning of verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that phrase, in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilling, fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sins, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So, then, we are debtors, not to the flesh, 
to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as children, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Some of your translations might read in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. So ends the reading. An old Anglican prayer. Most Holy Father, God, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For thy precious Son's sake we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul encourages us to live as God's children. We've been set free from slavery. We've been set free from the power of sin, death, and the devil. We're no longer slaves. We've been adopted by God himself. We've been made heirs of God. These are the reasons that we're encouraged to live as God's children. We've been adopted by God. Through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, the power of sin and death was destroyed. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, who worked faith in our hearts, the wonderful benefits of Christ's work have been made ours. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we've been adopted by God. Our lives have been changed. Verse 12. So then we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We no longer live according to our sinful nature. That sinful nature is no longer our master. The power of the sinful nature has been crucified on the cross. We can conquer the sinful nature with the help of the Spirit. With the help of the Spirit, we can put the sinful nature to death. And we put that sinful nature to death by coming to God with a broken and contrite heart. Verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We come to God with a broken and contrite heart, with hearts of repentance, admitting our failings and our shortcomings because we no longer live in fear. We no longer live in fear of punishment because Christ has taken our punishment. We're not afraid to admit our shortcomings because we recognize that our eternal salvation is not dependent upon what we do, our own works. Our eternal salvation is dependent on the achievements and the accomplishments of Christ alone. Look at verses 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Christ's achievements make it possible for us to have a new relationship with God. We no longer hide in fear of him as a righteous judge. Our perception of him has been changed. And our reality is this. God, the righteous judge, is our heavenly father. He is our dear father. And I know there are people here today who think about their dad, their father, and it's not good memories. Understand that. But please don't confuse that failed, broken person with the heavenly father. Because he is the best father that we truly could have. 
He is always watching over us. He's always ready and willing to listen. He provides and he cares for us perfectly at all times in all situations according to his infinite wisdom. Your situation may not turn out the way you want it to turn out. Not how you think it should be. But in his infinite wisdom, your situation will turn out according to God's will for what he knows is best for you. We can be sure of this by the testimony of the Holy Spirit recorded for us in the Bible. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We're also certain that God is our dear Father by the testimony of the faith that he has worked through the Holy Spirit in our hearts. When we believe, what, we, what we believe is in conformity with what the Scripture has to say, then we have a very personal piece of inf- ev- ev- evidence that indeed the God of the Bible is also the God who lives in our hearts and in our lives. When our confession agrees with the words of Scripture, then we have a certain assurance that the Bible teaches us What the Bible teaches us is also true in our lives. It is indeed true that God is our dear Father and we are his dear children. Now, having said all that, you're like, like, that's only the intro? Having said all that, we are not, we are not the pampered children of an indulgent father. In fact, in fact, to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is a double-edged sword. Being led by the Holy Spirit puts us at war with the world. Being led by the Holy Spirit puts us being led by the Holy Spirit puts us at war with the world and not being led by the Holy Spirit puts us at war with God. Our creator Verse 17. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. In reaction, the reaction of sin is a violent one to the teachings of God. Sinful men violently put Jesus, true God, to death. Sinful men will certainly react to Christ preaching today as we carry his word into the world. Either the Spirit will call them to faith or they'll rebel against the call of the Spirit and their rage may be taken out on us. When we tell people that they're not good enough by their works to go to heaven, they don't like that. When we tell Hindus and Muslims and Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons that they are not going to go to heaven by what they have done, it enrages them. When we tell those who say that their works make them righteous, that filthy sinners are declared wholly free of charge. They think it's outrageous. It makes them angry. They hate our way because it exposes how unholy they really are. Even though we're trying to help them, the scripture warns us, don't expect anything but suffering. You have inherited the condemnation of the world. That is part of your inheritance. You've inherited the condemnation of the world. They're going to call you judgmental. They're going to call you narrow-minded. They're going to say that you're brainwashed. They may even take your property or your life. The words of the Holy Spirit make that clear. But mark this. Anyone who tells you that the Christian experience brings you wealth and fame and no suffering is not speaking according to the Holy Spirit of God. If they tell you that the Christian life is all about what you're going to get, what he's going to do to you, and that you'll never have another problem or any more troubles the rest of your life, they are not speaking by the Holy Word of God. They are not being led by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, Verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, 
for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Without the Holy Spirit, you are lost in your sins. One day you will meet God, and there will be absolutely no possibility that he will receive you as his child. Without God, the Holy Spirit's help, we have no capacity to look at Christ as Savior. In fact, without the Spirit, what Christ does seems foolish. You remember the four friends who had the paralyzed friend? Couldn't use his legs? They bring him to Jesus. The crowd is so dense they can't get to him. So they climb up on the roof, tear it apart, lower him through the roof down to, right in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Son, your sins are forgiven. Bah, bah, it, his le- it's, his, it's his legs. We don't need a sermon. We need a healing. We need a heal. What, what, what's this? What, what? Can you imagine what they're thinking? But you see, We don't need a life coach. We don't need a life coach. We don't need a mentor. We don't even need a healer. We need a Savior. We need someone who is willing and able to rescue us from ourselves and from our damnation. We need a savior. Disobedience has a wide-ranging effect in our lives, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental. Consequences of disobedience are seen throughout the scripture, from the book of Genesis to Revelation. And today, we're witnessing how lives are being destroyed through immorality, crime, greed, selfishness, indifference, other rebellious actions and attitudes. God has a reason that he has allowed all of these negative things to be recorded in his holy word. He wants us to learn from all those various people in the past who disobeyed him so that we won't keep going down that same destructive path over and over again. It's for our good that these things are recorded because God in his love wants to protect us from the ugly consequences of rebelling against him because to disobey him is to willingly choose to walk in the will of Satan. To walk out of God's protection. That's the choice that we have before us in the starkest of terms. If we cannot trust God to lead us by his spirit, then we lose the opportunity to enter heaven. And if that's not a good option, because hell is real. But if we do follow the spirit, then we become targets of the world. And that can be a difficult thing as well. It's a difficult thing. But it's not impossible. Because our passage says that as heirs of Christ's suffering, we're also heirs of his glory. Verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Christ's glory is seen after his resurrection. Christ was raised imperishable. Just as we share in his suffering, we shall share in his glory. It's that promise and that certain hope which motivates us to suffer along with Christ. Verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Or as I said, it could, be, it could read in us in your translation. The promise of life eternal, the wonderful reward that are ours, give us every reason to willingly suffer for the one who made these things possible. We know that our sufferings won't even compare with the glory, the perfection, the satisfaction, the enjoyment, the fulfillment that will be ours for eternity. Know this, that your sufferings are not in vain. Your sufferings are proof that you are a co-heir with Christ. Now right now, someone in the room is going, all right, all right, enough with the suffering. Aren't you going to give us those things that we need to do to be so we can be better people? 
Aren't you going to give us that list of five things that's going to give us the best life now? That's not my job. That's not what I'm called to do. And that's not the job of calling or calling of any Bible-believing preacher that gets up behind a podium to speak at a service. No. As the scripture says, we preach Christ and him crucified. Church is where you come to have an encounter with the living God through his living word. Not to hear a bunch of empty platitudes and be sent off with a checklist of things to do this week. That's not what we're here for. The purpose is not to leave this place recharged. It's to leave this place changed. We sing about encountering God and the Spirit of God. If you truly encounter the Spirit of God, you will be changed. Or you'll be one of those that we talked about earlier who leave unaffected. To find ourselves going out of the door, not wondering where to eat or when the game starts, but finding ourselves grasping the impact on our lives that to be led by the Holy Spirit means to be at war with the world. And to not be led by the Holy Spirit means to be at war with God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? Answer yes or no. Because each has its own implications. Reverend Dr. Leopoldo Sanchez is a systematics professor at Concordia Seminary. He writes that he's always amazed at people who say, I want the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me because the Bible is full of eye-opening examples of things that happened to people who were led by the Holy Spirit. The Virgin Mary became a pregnant teenager. Joseph and his family had to flee to Egypt in exile. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to go without food for 40 days in the wilderness and then be tempted by the devil. And then the Holy Spirit led him to testify in front of his home church that he was the Messiah. And they ran him out of the church, ran him to the edge, and tried to throw him off a cliff. When the apostles were touched by the Holy Spirit and they began preaching Jesus, they'd get run out of town they get chased down. All but one of them died a martyr. Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, was stoned to death. In high school and college classrooms around the globe, students are being taught that religion, and especially Christianity, contributes to the problems of the world. The University of Minnesota's online libraries include an entry titled Sociological Perspectives on Religion. And among its ex explanations of the role of religion in society is this entry. Religion reinforces and promotes social inequality and social conflict. It helps convince the poor to accept their lot in life. It leads to hostility and violence motivated by religious differences. Beliefs and practices are not sacred unless people regard them as such. Once they're regarded as sacred, well then they take on, I should say, then they take on special significance and give meaning to people's lives. Christianity Today reported the results of the Pew Research Project. I hope you're braced for this. Do you remember when Rod had his chart up here? And he told us that only a third of the population of the planet is part of Christian, is call themselves Christian? I wish I could tell you it gets better. Christianity Today reported the results of a Pew Research Project. Developed countries with modern secular educational facilities in the post-World War II era have shifted towards post-Christian, secular, globalized, multicultural, multi-faith societies. And we are no different. We are no different because the Pew Research people found that in 2020, this isn't 30 years ago, this isn't 10 years ago, this isn't even five years ago, 
This is 2020. 47% of Americans said they have an association with a church. That's down from 70% in 1999. 47% have some kind of association with the church. Now think about those that are just saying they belong to a church. Think about the churches that don't preach the inerrant, authoritative word of God. Writing in Into the Future, Turning Today's Church Trends into Tomorrow's Opportunities, Elmer Towns writes on page 37, numerous studies confirm that the public, especially the media and intellectual leaders, do not see Christianity as a dominant social force. Six out of ten Americans feel the church is irrelevant. There are 170 million non-Christians living in America, making us the third largest mission field in the world. Is there a neighbor on your mind right now? Is the Lord prompting you to think about a coworker? Somebody in your coffee circle? I hope so. Are you prepared to be in the minority? God's people have always been in the minority. It wasn't Israel's population and military strength that conquered and held the promised land. It was the unfailing might of God Almighty executing his plan for his people and his world. Now, it's never easy to suffer. Jesus didn't have an easy time going to the cross. Well, what does the Holy Spirit say? Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus kept his eyes focused on the joy before him, the joy of knowing that he was wiping our slates clean, focusing on giving us free salvation. With his eyes on the reward, he went to the cross so we could have heaven. And our passage gives us that same thought. Verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us in us. When we compare the crosses that you have to go through with the glory that will be revealed in heaven, it doesn't compare. The Spirit says be willing to suffer, expect to suffer, but know that in the end, when you are revealed as God's children and receive the inheritance of eternal heaven, it will have been worth it. And that's the benefit of being connected to Christ. That's the benefit of being in Christ. Paul never calls anybody a Christian. We've just seen that all kinds of people call themselves Christian. The question before us is, are you in Christ? your reading assignment for this afternoon, Ephesians chapter 2, where he makes it clear, and he talks about, it's about being in Christ. In Christ. The book of Ephesians is all about becoming the body of Christ. The book of Colossians is all about Jesus as the head of that body. Some rainy day, take time to read your Bible. That's the good news. We don't go it alone. It's all God. Or as Pastor Sean likes to say, God does the verb. God the Spirit points us to the cross of Jesus. That's where we can find that's where we find what can be found nowhere else. Love so profound that we can't understand it. Forgiveness so complete that even the most vile person is made holy. Life so abundant that it lasts into eternity and inheritance as the sons and daughters of God. The leading of the Holy Spirit always challenges the thinking of the world. We heard earlier that when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples on the, that first Pentecost day, it caused such a stir that the apostles were accused of being drunk in the middle of the morning. So I ask you again, do you want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Are you ready to be led by the Holy Spirit? 
Look at what happened on Pentecost. A group of uneducated, scared, confused, unfocused followers of Jesus are changed. They become the people God uses to launch the most incredible movement ever, the Christian church. From the moment the disciples step out speaking multiple languages, God the Holy Spirit has pushed believers into the world to tell what great things God has done in Christ. Are being gathered here today. Tells us the Holy Spirit is at work. He's kept the church alive through the centuries. The faith has crossed oceans and continents so that we may be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's the Holy Spirit that led parents to place their children into confirmation. And by the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they got to learn from Pastor Sean. He got to teach them what God gave them in their baptismal faith. They've become part of that line of believers that includes some of the giants of the faith who were brought into fellowship with Christ by the Holy Spirit. Men and women of this congregation have assumed God-given responsibilities as officers and board members of the congregation. Many, many more serve the body without, by, by the Spirit's guidance with no formal recognition or title. And still others have been called and are being called out of our midst to go on to seminary and beyond. The person that cleans the church is just as called as the church chairman. The person that greets you at the door is just as called as the pastor in the pulpit. And every one of you sitting here, watching by the internet, listening on the radio, are called, just as called as our synodical president. You are called to serve and to worship God. But know this, and never forget this, that anytime someone surrenders their own interests for the benefit of God's kingdom, you will need to be led by the Holy Spirit because you will be put square into the very real, very brutal conflict between the kingdom of light and the kingdoms of the world. Whenever we confess the Lord Jesus, whenever God brings a new believer into the kingdom through the baptismal fount, whenever he feeds us the body and blood of Christ, We know the Holy Spirit is doing his work. It's the marks, the signs that the Spirit of the living God is gathering believers under the cross of Jesus. It's the signs that God is at work blessing and confirming us into the faith that forgives and loves the faith that makes us children of God, the faith that God has entrusted to us so that we can share it with the world. In the book of Acts, we read about Paul going to Athens, Greece, and we find a Greek culture that's with many gods. And he stands in front of the people and he says, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. I even found an altar that was marked to the unknown God. Covering all the bases. The unknown God. In many ways, we live in a culture that's no different. An extremely religious culture. No shortage of gods in the world today. We worship them all. Money. Family job, pleasure, self. God is the one who gives us life and breath and all things. God is the one who commands us to confess our rebellion, turn away from our sins, and then gives us a new beginning through his forgiveness. The Holy Spirit is the one who shows us this unknown God, who calls us to follow Christ, gathers us into community, enlightens us with his knowledge and his gifts, keeps us in the faith. Everyone who claims to believe and hopes that they've found forgiveness in Christ Jesus has been called to do so by the Spirit. You didn't come to this conclusion on your own. No. That's what the Spirit does. This is where the confirmation students come in. They could, they could probably recite this for you. Martin Luther wrote, I believe I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith, even as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church in, on earth. It's the Spirit who does the calling. But the Spirit does more than call. The Holy Spirit gathers us into the community. We're not only created to be in a relationship with God, we're created to be in relationships with others within the body of Christ. Again, read Ephesians. 
It's in community we study the Holy Word of God. It's in community we share the elements of communion. It's in community we feel our sorrows and celebrate our joys. It's in community we're lifted up when we're beaten down, given an opportunity for forgiveness when we go astray. The Holy Spirit enlightens us, enlightens us not only with knowledge of God and the love of Christ, enlightens us with gifts to each to reach out to the society and community around us. Every single one of you has an important role to play with the gifts the Spirit has given you. So stop the playground stuff about comparing your gift with his gift or her gift. And give up the fat head aspect that somehow you're more gifted than somebody else. And don't dismiss yourself because you somehow think that you're less gifted than someone else. God gives each of you gifts to serve him, serve others. Every one of you who is in Christ has been given gifts. And finally, the Holy Spirit sanctifies, sets us apart. Of course, in this life, we're simultaneous saints and sinners, but we're called to give ourselves to God, who through the Holy Spirit brings transforming power to our lives. The church is called to be different from the society around us. We should stand out in everyday life. We should stand out. We should be different. I'm afraid a lot of us go into stealth mode once we leave on Sunday. One of the best ways to make a powerful statement of faith to the people around you is the way you live your life. Take a deep breath. As the team comes up, I'm going to wrap this up. God, in his mercy, became one of us because he wanted to make us holy because he wanted to give us the inheritance of heaven. So he came and he died for us. He washed us and he made us his own in baptism. There are many in this world who don't like that message. The Jews of Jesus hated it. Jesus' time hated it. And the people that focus on their own works for righteousness of today still persecute us for it. They complain that we're not worthy of heaven. But the Spirit of God declares to you today, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. You are a child. You are adopted. Even though you don't deserve it. You are an heir. Even though you did nothing to earn it. Do you know him? Do you know the one who has done this for you? Jesus has done it all. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the lion of Judah. He's the dying lamb. He's a lowly baby. Eternal life he brings. He's a humble servant. He's the king of kings. He's a king. He's the king. The king who was stripped. So we could be robed. He's the king who was scarred. So that we could be healed. He's the king that was forsaken. So that we could be forgiven. He's the humble king. Wore a crown of thorns so that we might wear an imperishable crown. Do you know him? Are you in Christ? He saves you, calls you, he cleanses you, he promises you, you are a child through faith. On this Pentecost Sunday, we as Christians are held to a higher standard. And as the world continues to ridicule and humiliate us when we miss the mark, 
Our God has given us a part of himself to be with us when we need him the most. The advocate, the helper, the comforter. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit comes to us in our darkest places, puts his arms around us, and he saves us. He gives us the strength to carry on. Or to be led by the Holy Spirit. To be at war with the world. God, grace be with each of you. His name. Would you stand with us as we sing our last song? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me, who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, his friend, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who oh, the sun sets free. Who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for I'm a child of God, yes I am. Sing in my Father's house. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. There are elders here this morning. Would you raise your hands? The elders for the church, look around you. Look around you. These men have dedicated themselves to helping you to understand what it is to be in Christ. If you don't know what that is, I pray you won't leave today until you know. Receive the benediction. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy the batteries to die. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, right after the service here, probably about 11 o'clock, we'll have that uh, little get-together over in the fellowship hall. And I just want to say thank you to all of the volunteers that do so many things here at Victory. And uh, one of the things we did recently was there were countless hours, hundreds of hours that people put in getting burned Palms property ready for sale down there. We thank everyone, everyone who helped out with that. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the people who helped with, you know, Sunday school, Awanas, uh, on the soundboard, you know, any of the other ministries here at Victory. So on behalf of the elders, I want to say thank you. Yes. I would like to echo that as well. Thank you, Doug. Um, with that being said, barbecue at 11. And if we don't see you, have a wonderful week. God bless you guys. Enjoy the beautiful day. And wherever you're at, if you're watching online, I hope it's a beautiful day for you too. Probably not in Washington, though, because I think it's raining there. God bless you guys.